No, that's actually leads into the next part of the discussion, which is the tournament organizers. Because if you look at it, one essentially, if I had to describe the two models we're talking about, the real prem premise of the NBA is as long as the NBA succeeds, we all make money. We all share the rev, we all do well. And so that's why they have, you know, the salary caps, the draft system that Nazgul's referring to. The Premier League is more like, look, everyone at this level makes, you know, maybe we share the TV rights and stuff, but like the revenue are makes my money. You, know, you make your own. So essentially it's, it's dependent on what your philosophy is. And I get the sense actually alludes to a lot of the owners I was referring to earlier who want to come in or do come in and then don't like CS. They come in thinking it's going to be that model where it's like, right, so we're in CS now, like you're saying, guys, so we succeed, right? Yeah, we make money now. It's like, well, no, what have you done? Like, what's your brand? What have you built? Have you had success in the game? So in terms of the tournament organizers, a real problem we have in CS at the moment, just in terms of the day-to-day -day money you can get from the tournament organizer, is the very same tournament organizers themselves are in a similar predicament. They're losing money. They've got massive budgets. They're in a position where they're already at the moment sort of tapped out in terms of some of the sponsors. You don't see ASL announce a new sponsor that's 10, 10, 10x the revenue. It just doesn't happen at the moment. We haven't got to that point in time. So one of the concerns, and this is actually where a lot of the whole dispute publicly of Flashpoint ASL came from, was the notion of if these guys essentially are losing money and they have to make as much themselves back, their share has to be big essentially, otherwise they won't continue to exist and it won't matter if the teams are there, then the teams, uh, they're taking the crumbs from the table as it were. Obviously, they wouldn't describe that. We'd say they've just a minor partner or something. So this is a concern. And in fact, I'll even add in Nazgul, the reason why that's a really tricky topic in my opinion is they're sort of blurring the line. On the one hand, you can have a slot on the other hand, as you say, at the same time you're trying to share the rev with this bigger partner of yours, if you describe the TO that way, he will also let in a random team that might come from nowhere that might just win you the, the money and the, and the exposure and everything that you wanted. So it's a really tricky spot we're in with the TOs. Like I don't, one of the reasons why I might disagree with decisions people make, but I actually, if I think about ESL in isolation, I feel for ESL. I know they're in a tough spot. I know that nobody knows the way out of this yet. So wait, what are your thoughts on some of these issues, Nazgul? Because obviously, if we want to increase the rev that the... the team organizations make fixing the to thing above them is is something that has to happen right mm. um yeah i actually i actually think we're on a decent path forward um uh esl just share it with their teams so so they guarantee a certain dollar amount um to the teams like hey no matter what the revenues are we will pay you this and so if they yes. don't make if they don't make the revenues they need to get that from investment for example um they actually made more revenue um, uh, than the minimum guarantee. So okay. that, that is a good sign. Um, and I think there there is a path, but hi historically, I, of course it's complicated. I mean, building a new sport is not simple. And, and that's basically what's going on in, in esports. So uh, for a while teams were like, well, we're participating in all of these tournaments and all of these leagues, but you're not paying us. Why are we not making money? And their the response would also be, yeah, but you're not making money. I'm not making money. Like, how am I supposed to? How am I supposed sure. to share that? Um, I, I do think, um, I do, I do think there's there is an optimistic path for growth there. Um, but but of course that's true. Like the league income in any sport is very very important. Like even for team revenues. Like we can have our own sponsors and uh, in esports we can have our own media rights and we sell our own merchandise. Um, but the league revenue for an NBA team um, is incredibly important. And I think that's the case for us as well. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I do applaud the efforts that are going on uh, right now in Counter-Strike. And I, I feel the right skill sets are there um, to provide a path forward. I, I think that uh, if you look at this from a, and this is a very American mindset, but I think it's correct to use. So it, you, you take, let's say Counter-Strike as a pie, right? And right now, and normally Counter Strike, but there's a lot of games out there. Even some sure. of those games where there's franchise, quote unquote, slots, hard assets in there, and you can see that. I mean, I said I told you before, there's no magic, right? If players are losing money, I mean, sorry, if teams are losing money, leagues are losing money. There's somebody in there who's not losing money, okay? And and very very often that is the publisher actually. So mm -hmm. where where I come into is esports the competitive aspect of these video games increases player retention, player acquisition on these games and gives them a long tail. Without eSports, that long tail is shorter yes. and there is less retention, there is less dollars spent on skins and things of that nature. So the publisher, if, if, if the goal is to keep eSports alive, has the responsibility to come in and either help regulate so that these parties that already own part of the pie find sustainability 
um, economically mo uh, motivate those parties to be a part of it or a combination of both, right? Because there is no, it's, make no mistake, like Valve is making a lot of fucking money with Counter-Strike. Yes. Okay? Nobody's talking about it because they're always hands off. I, I, I appreciate that at times, right? That can be good at times, but at some point you have to put the big boy pants and say, do I want this to die or do I want this to thrive? And they have a responsibility here. Not only them, but every publisher that has an esports, um, that, ha that has esports. Uh, they have to come in at some point. Either your goal is to have full control over what's go what, goes go sorry, what goes on in there, and you just provide um, a either a minimum guarantee to everybody involved that everybody's happy with, or alternatively, you give them upside from a ref share model perspe perspective. Uh, uh, so if the game does well monetarily, the teams and the leagues and everybody that's involved in the system get a portion of it. Or I don't know what that looks like exactly. But they do have a responsibility with this. And mm -hmm. here's, here's my take. I think that eventually um, one publisher will get it right. And then the Pandora's box will have been opened. And it'll be very hard for publishers generally not to adhere to those new standards because they will be proven to work. And a perfect example is actually Rainbow Six, where the game is a decent game. It's not the best game in terms of like players playing the game, players watching the game. Uh, it's not the best game. It's a decent game. But trust me, the amount of money that you can make there relative to the actual viewership, relative to the actual player base, is very high. So then you have teams like ours that are like, shit, I want to invest even more in this game. And then what happens as a result is what happened in 2019 when all the teams came into the Rainbow Six League, which is that the fucking game boomed. Like, it just boomed. So everybody was playing, everybody right, was watching. And why? Yes. Because of the esports competitions. Yes. Because the publisher backed the game up then you can argue things might have turned a little sideways in 2020, but still pretty decent, right? But that is a proof of concept of saying, actually, if the publisher is equally invested as every other party in the cake, in the, in the cake mm -hmm. um, it is going to work, or at least has a higher chance of working. And I yep. think that's the responsibility Valve carries. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I I, I can't speak uh, for for G two, but it sounds like maybe it's similar. But uh, Duncan, like, if you if you compare all games within Liquid, and this is not not taking into account like the amount of fandom, the size, the amount of exposure, but purely like financial health. Rainbow Six is the most healthy for Team Liquid, uh, mm -hmm. the, the most healthy here. game that we are in, uh, because of the the skin program that uh, Ubisoft works with us on in a extremely collaborative way. We get our creative people on calls with their creative people. They listen to input. It, I mean, it's honestly, uh, it's really well done and really well designed. There's a ton of opportunity elsewhere in the space to do to do similar things. But um, I, th I think there's like, there's a couple different classes of publishers. There's one publishers that do absolutely nothing, right? Like, let's think of Nintendo and Smash. Uh, there, there's just nothing. I mean, there, you could even say there's Minus Maybe value, if anything, yes. Minus, well, minus value sometimes, down. <laughs> arguably. Sure. Um, then there's publishers um, uh, that look at esports like, uh, let's say, marketing. I, I think a lot of what, what what Carlos mentioned, I think, touches on that, right? Like, if we are in esports, there's much more player retention. There's eyeballs on our game. There's people streaming. Um, I can pay something against that to make that worthwhile. Uh, great. It, you know, that could be, be really interesting for teams. Um, or that could be really interesting for teams and TOs to sort of make whole the ecosystem and have have it make make sense. And then the last one is like when these games really get to a um, high level um, to to be large sports, the publisher could potentially run the sport as a business in a yes. vacuum. Um, it it will still market. It will still be awesome for marketing, but you can actually run it as a, as a business. Um, and I think that's obviously, I mean, if you could choose, that's the end state that you want to get to. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I would take the marketing, um, a state any day of the way, any day of the week as well. Um, yes. but, uh, yeah, those are some, some different approaches. I, along these lines, actually, I think Carlos brings up a very good point here, which I do think actually gets philosophically to where the game dev of CS Valve is at, which is basically, even though if a game dev comes in, at the moment, basically, I always joke that, like, it's not that I think Valve's the best dev for esports. I just love the fact that they're, like, the absent parent and we just get to do whatever we want in the house. Like, the other parents are the super strict ones where you have to follow their religion there. You know, like, it's like, but, the, but those aren't the two best options, in my opinion. Like, I would want Valve to somewhere be involved. My problem is I just don't want them to come in and say, right, get out of here. I'm, I'm running the league. I'm deciding this. So I, I like the the idea that you're you're attacking it on the level that they're on, which is they make the game. 
They have items in the game. They have aspects in the game. So why not you? Why not make that the point at which you share with the TOs, the the, the team yeah. orgs, etc.? Because basically, they would one not area any part of the the ecosystem, right? It's no, no, exactly. Diff. Yes, but because basically, my concern with Valve is this: Valve has always, when they do speak, it's nearly always privately in back channels, unfortunately, about these topics. They are always essentially what we call the egalitarian philosophy. They try to make it like right. It's just about the players. So you know, we want every player to have just as good a chance. Like that's why, in theory, anyone could qualify for the major it's not logistically going to happen me and you can't make a team and qualify but we could in theory if we if we won in the game the problem with that approach is it's somewhat like i said earlier antithetical to the idea of building a business because we have to have these brands continue to increase in value otherwise eventually it's not worth it it's only worth it for whatever the minimum is to get in so either there's the, the business or there is no entertainment is honestly that simple yeah this is what i'm going to get to so the analogy i would give is this if you're valve right i understand why in the early days when they worried you know t the orgs are going to exploit people they wanted for example players to own the major spot they wanted anyone to be able to qualify the problem with some of these approaches though overall is like as Carlos said like they're not you're not just watching it's not like esports only benefits from the game being good the game benefits from esports definitely like if i think of the last csgo major right where we had this shock that the team at the time called a vanguard they're now virtus pro came out of nowhere no one even thought they'd make the playoffs never might go to the final Right, I guarantee you, if the bracket instead was Team Liquid against Astralis in the final, that's a way more watched final. That's a way more remembered final. That's some. It, there's all elements that come into it because the point is, Team Liquid has an established fan base. They represent something like it's cool that there was an underdog story. Yeah, if you're the if you're the bleeding heart of Valve, yeah, that's great that they were able to do that. The problem is in this scenario, like you can't act as though right. I have to give everything equal to a Vanguard and Team Liquid in this case because Team Liquid has got more skin in the game. Like they're invested in your game long term and they're bringing as with him, they're bringing implied value to your company sometimes direct value even maybe and, and said the players the don't get paid in equality the yes. players get paid in money in dollars okay and there's a lot of them the, a lot of dollars required to make them happy okay so if you want a player to invest his whole life in getting better at the game and thus giving you a better entertainment you better fucking make sure there's a business that makes sense for those people that pay the player you know so it, it just it's just abc there is no magic as i said right and 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 you know what the problem is with, with publishers? And this is a deeper issue that I said, as I said, it will get fixed, I think. This is my theory. It will get fixed over time. And you know, and, and you know what helps? Helps when G2 Esports never dies, when Team Liquid never dies, when uh, Fnatic never dies, when TSM never dies, when these organizations never die and they remain alive. And every time they're alive, they get new fans on board, new fans on board, new fans on board. And then eventually you go to a point of no return where the publisher needs these, pub these brands associated with the game for uh, for the purpose of keeping their, their 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 game alive, right? If he has competitive aspects, so uh, the problem that these publishers have right now is that they're treating esports as okay, that's a thing. In parallel, you know, they do like this, right? We don't need to give them money, right? That shit should be self sufficient by itself, you know. That's for you guys. So, but that but that ignores the fact that that the existence of that. Uh, esports system generates money for their own, right? And without yes. that esports system in place, they will generate less money. They will generate. They will have less players, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So, what has to change eventually in terms of mindset, in terms of principles, is for publishers to start acknowledging these esports structures as either they go all in with them, either they allow them to exist by helping them, either regulating, uh, plus um, uh, providing MGs or giving. Uh, those minimum guarantees, long term, the term yes. benefits or ref share, whatever, right? Uh, or alternatively, they say, fuck esports, you know? And they just simply don't allow for any esports competition that is official to exist, right? And just keep everything very Smash Brothers like, right? And and you see what happened then, right? Uh, that shit just doesn't go anywhere. Uh, literally doesn't go anywhere. There's no business in there. So eventually it'll die out. And, and, and the game won't benefit as much from having that system in place. So I think that you can't have it all. It's that simple. You simply can't have it all. They're thinking, okay, if I create a G2 Esports skin, that means that will cannibalize some of my other sales because somebody that buys the G2 Esports rifle skin will maybe not buy the skin that I made myself that I have sure. 100% make all the profit from, yes. Yeah, 100% margin on, right? And that's fair. But what if the question is, yeah, that person might not actually be playing the game if G2 Esports is not there? Right, mm -hmm. which is factually and mathematically the case to a degree. So that's the question they have to start asking themselves, and they have to start giving a, a dollar value to that. And that mm -hmm. dollar value has to be invested 
in the esports ecosystem. Yes. Mm. I, I, I would say, though, like, uh, well, I, I think, um, not sure if I understood you correctly on the you have to be all in or, or, or not. Um, cause I, cause what resonated with me earlier, you mentioned that you appreciate the difference in between Counter-Strike, between League of Legends. I mm -hmm. do think there's a, I think there's plenty of balance between maybe not being all in on esports and doing a lot for it, for its scene. Uh, and I think Valve could do a lot more for Dota and Counter-Strike, um, a lot, a lot more. Um, I think, I think Duncan, like, I think while everything you said makes sense to me, you can definitely argue, Hey, here's an organization that has spent. 20 times the investment into players into creating content they've been here for five years they've been here for 10 years why are you treating everyone as equal uh, that i think that's a real argument to make but at the same time if you get into subjective things like that um it becomes really complicated for a publisher that ultimately philosophically probably wants to just focus on making games that's what they sure. want to be good at that's what they want to be great at and so i think they strive for systems where they don't have to get into that much depth, right? So if Valve yeah. can say, here's the major, if you qualify, we'll get you a skin. You know, it sucks if you're an organization that was here for 10 years that didn't qualify and you, pay, you, you spent a lot of money investing, you know, too bad for you. But at least it, it allows them to do some good with semi-minimal investment. And, and And so I think when we think of how can we get more out of out of a valve? I, th I think we have to try and keep it simple for them, at least for the for the time being. And I, I will also say, actually, and maybe maybe Valorant is pushing some of it of this, or maybe there's other reasons for some sort of um, cultural advancement or change on at, at Valve. Like on the one hand, there's an interesting conversation with teams with Valve in Counter Strike that that I can't really share too much about right now. But for Dota, um, they actually just publicly announced digital items for teams. Um, so a Team Liquid can make voice lines in the game. We can have Team Liquid sprays in the game. Uh, we can have, have a, a loading screen, and we can have some digital IP in the game. That is a massive, massive change from the past uh, pretty much 10 years for Valve in, in, in Dota. Um, they also just updated their spectating client for Dota. Um, for the DPC system, made huge improvements. Um, so I think something's going on there. And, and, and I'm not saying like, oh, now they're doing everything right. Um, but there there might be something here that's trending into the right direction um, that, that has real potential. Okay. I mean, yeah, a concern I, I have on that. A concern I have on these lines, though, is, again, it essentially comes back to what the philosophy and the, the perspective and worldview of the game dev is. Because like, I'll give an example from the past that people might know. One of the things that spurred on the LCS being franchised was an infamous comment that one of the original game developers, one of the people behind Riot Games made, where he implied publicly that TSM was making profit on League of Legends and then mm. wasting it on another game. Now, at the that time, was rough, that was almost, I remember almost that every org came out like, what are you even talking about? Like, we're losing money in the game. What? What? Is, what? And so it basically spurred on the idea of like, essentially, it's not that like. Listen, that was wrong, but it's more like they, they just don't understand our worldview. So we have to get together. We have to show them that like we have to work together. Basically, like, if anything, we're losing money in your game. We're in it for other reasons, you know. So I actually get the sense maybe it's changing, like you say, Victor. But I get the sense that Valve, especially because they were so hands off. I think people take for granted that they knew how the operations costs of a team are or how much mm. the salaries are of an average team. I don't think they actually, I think they maybe had ballparks for some of these things. But for example, like, I don't think they necessarily understood that, like, people are losing money. And especially, I think they might actually, I agree with Carlos, I think they might have been naive enough to think, well, if I cut you in on my action, as it were, by, you know, making a G2 SMG skin or something, well, then, you know, why would I do that when I could just sell the other SMG skin for 100% of it? But the obvious answer is, if anyone knows how affiliate marketing works, affiliate affiliate marketing works. Well, the point is, it, it might not be the same person. Like maybe a fan who's only a fan of G2 and is buying it because he saw Nico use it, that guy wouldn't have bought the other SMG skin. So it doesn't matter that you're, you're getting only 70% of the sale. It's 70% of a sale that exists versus the one that doesn't. So maybe they're coming around on that one. But I still feel like, like this is why it's actually a kind of sad that this is a problem in a lot of games. Because even though all the monetization in most esports games isn't there, maybe Rainbow Six is doing great, great if so. It's not the biggest esport though. Maybe it's not there in all the other games. But the difference is the in-game shit of selling the digital items, that is like, it's essentially a license to print money. So if everyone gets some level of access to that, which I realized no one has to give you, 
it, it does automatically start to fund the ecosystem. It somewhat offsets everyone's costs. For sure, for sure. That, that's exactly like, that is the type of rev share models you want to have. And, and it, it, this is where it should all end up going to. And of course, I guess, you know, the, the, there are other verticals, uh, you know, where maybe the publisher ends up having the, within their client, the actual um, stream, right? And then they can maybe monetize that and then you can, teams have, can eventually have access to that. But eventually, I mean, but, but ultimately the, the low hanging fruit is in-game items. It's that fucking simple. Like, it's that fucking yeah. simple. This is what no, the, it, this, this the, games there's, there's a lot of, make money from. Yeah, there's a lot of examples um, where you can kind of feel like hey, there's not, maybe the right understanding or right appreciation is uh, is not there. I mean, another one comes that comes to mind is when, and Valve, largely rectified this very recently in dota but like several years ago where they were just like yeah if you host a tournament with our ip people can restream it it's like oh that's rough that is rough i yes, mean if, we if you're to, an esl yeah if we need to build this business if we need to build these revenues if you want to you know uphold player salaries through their league agreements like how can you just say take any of these tournaments and start restreaming them on different platforms and that doesn't mean that i agree i think i think they had that Facebook deal back then. I think that was yes. like the, the, the yes. it's like, yeah, you know, that's not great. I, I, I get that. But if you're, if, if you tell ESL, like, Hey, don't take that Facebook money, go be on Twitch for the largest eyeballs. Shouldn't you be compensating them instead yes. of like making exactly. their life impossible? You, you um, can't so, have the power without the, resp you can't have the power to decide without the responsibility to give. Yeah. 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 So I, I think appreciation needs to definitely, uh, I, it's a work in progress. And honestly, I, I do think almost unquestionably on average um, across the board, every year there's more and more appreciation from publishers um, to what esports means, what teams can do for them, what teams can do for players. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe in some games it's not going uh, as fast as you would like. And sometimes that needs a little bit, you know, a little bit of a poke from the competition. And like I said, like, I, you know, maybe Valorant plays a role here um as well to to valve looking at counter-strike and and wanting to help a little bit more when wanting to do a little bit more and you know we've seen uh, we've seen so the player base for counter-strike is healthy but we've seen top uh, uh maybe not top players uh, maybe i think nitro is probably the best player that moved to valorant um but uh we, we've seen players move right what does it mean to valve that teams are operating a business where we can actually afford to compensate fallen as a competitive player for him not to say like, oh, I'm just going to be a Valorant streamer, right? Like, what does that mean when he has millions upon millions of followers that he's built over two decades of commitment to Counter-Strike 